Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of us are absolutely fascinated with royalty, aren't we? We followed what Queen Elizabeth did. We might have even watched the funeral. We might have wondered what Prince Charles was thinking a time or two. We were glued to the news when Diana died. We smiled as their children grew and formed their own families, even though we were continents apart. We loved watching the royal weddings, and in our house, that's as much about the boy choirs and the music on fine instruments as anything else, but it's a big deal. There are such pompous, regal celebrations. Somehow, watching royalty, how the other folks live, can become a hobby or at least an interesting bubble for our attention. Maybe even a diversion in which we can pretend we are involved in some way. What would we say or do if we were that person? And perhaps the reason we, as the world, were a little more fascinated with Diana is because she was not quite what the royalty were used to. She went rogue and redefined how royalty interacted with the rest of the world, visiting places that others had not gone and would not go, speaking and touching and hugging folks who would have previously been beneath her status as a royal. Now, I've seen the changing of the guard at Buckingham. It's quite a to-do. I've seen the crown jewels. They're very impressive but not nearly as impressive to me as the day I watched Diana in tears as she visited patients who had suffered debilitating blows and amputation from landmines. When it comes to royalty, as much as we might have fun watching their world, the cheap seats, Celebrity and pomp and circumstance. Doesn't their status and what they manage to do with or through their status mean more to us than the status alone? We want to see them use their clout, use their positions to do some good things in this world. We love it when they could be puffed up but choose instead to show humility. We are very familiar with that kind of royalty. Because our king, the king of kings, is that royalty. He is a different kind of king. Jesus, born in a very crude situation, not some fluffy bed with the support of human clout to back up his power. Jesus, training others rather than theologians and scribes training him into his power. Jesus, in fact, going rogue demonstrating divine power that would outdo every other power of his day. Jesus would speak to, touch, heal, and hang out with folks no one else expected him to. And he was often criticized for that. He would go through all sorts of trial and physical torture for having the power that he possessed. The closest he ever allowed himself to get to pomp and circumstance was his entry into Jerusalem. That was a grand time until those who hailed his power turned against him. They were enamored until the second they weren't. And that was about what he could do for them. They didn't understand. Their loyalty turned to betrayal. He did not do things the way they expected him to. They were expecting some sort of ride into victory that would come very easily and they could just be a part of it and celebrate. The very folks who observed him as royalty became the court jesters who would use Jesus as a cruel form of entertainment at his expense. Jesus was a different kind of king. Jesus is a different kind of king. We look for the serious. We yearn for the solid. We want something that will not ever waver, something glorious. Listen to this sentence. When the Son of Man came in his glory 
when he comes in all of his glory and the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. An English teacher would have had a fit about that. But there's a reason it's in there twice. Matthew uses the term twice in one sentence. It's as if he can't wait. He's so thrilled at what is to come that his sentence structure stutters with the awesomeness of it all. Have you ever seen a kid excited? You know how that can happen very easily. When he comes in all his glory to sit on his glorious throne, yes, all of the angels will be with him. It will be a spectacle, unmistakable. All of the nations will be gathered before him. And the closest we may ever get to conceptualizing this, pardon the analogies, might be the gathering at Woodstock. Or the collective celebrations of a new year in Times Square. Or the tragic numbers of human carnage that we discuss about 9-11. Or a mass killing in a foreign country that we cannot fathom. Those things are bigger. So much bigger. Jesus' first coming was mysterious, involving hiding and fleeing for protection. Jesus' second coming will be in a bright cloud of glory. There will be no mistaking the King of Kings on that day. Not for anyone. So we read that this day is coming and that we are to prepare. And to prepare, we must read Scripture as it is stated, not as we rewrite it to suit ourselves. Multiple times we read about the separation of sheep and goats. And how the Good Shepherd will do all of that, we don't need to try. We also read about what happens after, and that's very unpleasant for some. We don't want to think about that. There have been weeks in a row, have you noticed, in this fall series that I've read about wailing and gnashing of teeth and eternal damnation and hellfire and all of that, and then said, the gospel of our Lord. Let's be clear. There is no room for court jesters in Jesus' royal court. There's no room for pretending to be something that we're not, to be entertainers instead of faithful followers. Scripture does not say Jesus will separate the rich from the poor. No hitches on hearses either. Scripture does not say that Jesus will separate the educated on his right and the unlearned on his left. Scripture does say that Jesus and Jesus alone will separate the godly on his right hand and the wicked on the left. We Christians yearn for unity and rightfully so, but it is not our teaching from Scripture that hands out permission slip passes for ungodly action. Jesus determines who enters into the, the church and his courts for all eternity, who deems the court jesters, it's Jesus. Those involved in the entertainment of a group of folks but not taken seriously. In this case, the court jesters would include the ungodly, the unrepentant, those who would mock Jesus' name and God's authority, those who have elevated themselves to the seat of judgment, determination of who's in and who's out, those who refuse to do the work of his kingdom as he clearly outlines in Scripture. The king will say to the godly, those at his right hand, Come, you blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, you blessed of my father. The reason I often use the present tense in a benediction as it is meant to convey, you who are being blessed, the Lord is blessing you and keeping you. The Lord is making his face to shine on you. The reason for that. Jesus claimed his throne of royalty right there. My Father. The Son of God and the Son of Man is sharing his inheritance with us. He is using his royal scepter, which happens to be the good shepherd's staff. Jesus is a different kind of king. So what keeps us from being the jesters of God's court? The most obvious answer is that Good Lutheran Christians is grace. God's grace manifested through Jesus and delivered to us daily by the Holy Spirit 
God's mercy and God's will moving in and through our beings as the ultimate gift and sacrifice that's made on our behalf. Grace, that is the only thing that saves us because we can't do it without him. Grace that is offered to us regularly at the king's table. Thank God for God's grace. Jesus also has some specifics for us to pay attention to. To be sure, we don't need to think we earn our entrance to sit at his right hand. However, Jesus does have expectations that if we are to be extensions of his hands and feet in this world, if we are to represent the kingdom of God in this earthly life that he's given us, there are holy expectations of the inheritors of eternal life in him. And these are straight from the mouth of our Lord. Food and drink, the bare minimums of human need. If you've ever looked into the eyes of someone who is actually starving, I can tell you that it is close to feeling like God's servant as I have ever experienced to give them food. Clothing and radical hospitality. Even if those we give to do not realize they are accepting Christ when they accept the gifts they are. We are not responsible for their full understanding. We are responsible for carrying out Christ's mission in this world. Using our time to visit hurting people. There are those who feel confined in many ways. And opening the doors of our hearts to show them care in very real ways. To take our most precious commodity, time, to be among those who need companionship and compassion. These we too easily avoid in our own peripheries. That is a commitment to Christ. Ministries of food and shelter and time. Those are not flashy things. They are not difficult. Jesus' royal court does not require an unapproachable checklist of things we cannot pull off or do. But Jesus' sacrifice, grace, and mercy should provide in every believer's heart the room to kick out the jester that's in us and bring forth the action. Jesus is not looking for big tricks. He's not looking for big entertainment, for platitudes and large feats and who you know that calls others to glorify us. Jesus is looking for the humility and the servanthood that his kind of kingship causes us to be. As a community of faith, we regularly offer to Jesus some warmth, some clothing, some radical hospitality in the form of things to help our neighbors survive the elements, food, time, care. These offerings are not given to boast. Look at us. They are not given to keep us from making personal contact with those hurting around us. Not at all. These blessings for those who need care in our community, and we pray that those who receive care will understand God's love is better and comes to them to find strength in Him. Other churches have recognized needs with us for years. Even more churches are discerning the needs of our community out here in the country where a lot of people don't go. And joining in the royal court of Jesus as we ungesturize the actions of our faith, more closely aligning what we are doing with what Jesus tells us we are to be doing, we are so grateful to be able to be used as instruments of God's peace and love. And we know that God gets the glory for that. We're seeing more and more every day how the Holy Spirit is moving and working in our efforts to feed the poor and clothe the naked and spend time with folks who need hope. I just need a prayer. I don't know what to do. We're going to take a moment to stop and thank God for the blessings that we receive every single day. I invite you to spend some time thinking about our community, folks who travel through our parking lot every single day, Folks who are misguided who travel through our parking lot every single day. Folks who roam around our area. Yes, Salisbury area. Yes, Oregon Church Road. As much as we avert our eyes, we do have homeless here. 
We have just shared Thanksgiving and we are in the season of giving that causes us to focus and prioritize our roles in God's kingdom even more than usual. We all know the grace and mercy of God who meets us where we are and affords us his love in our areas of need no matter what. Today, we read specifically what Jesus has to say about the worth of our actions, avoiding being court jesters, serving his royalty by bowing our hearts. Let's pray over the blessings we receive and the blessings that we pass along that whatever and whoever receives those blessings will know the warmth of Jesus' love because then they will know they are not alone in this world that they will see a physical manifestation of God's grace and mercy, and that as their physical warmth is better sustained, then their hearts will warm to the message of Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit's movement in their lives. Let us pray. Gracious Shepherd King, thank you for your reign in our hearts. Forgive us when we forget your royal nature. Forgive us when we play the court jester more than we bow to your will. We ask your Holy Spirit to be with us, guiding us as an extension of your love. We pray that through the Advent calendars, the aid we and others of our community give to those in need, every charitable offering given, and every clothing item, that you would gather your children in your peace. Comfort them with your Holy Spirit as we have been comforted by your Holy Spirit. Use these tangible things that you instruct us to share to reinforce your presence in their lives. May we revere your kingdom with such intensity that your grace would shine through in unmistakable ways so that we truly serve as extensions of your lordship. Thank you for being the kind of king that you are. In the precious name of Jesus, our king, we pray. Amen.